Hello, everyone. Welcome to Oak Ridge First Cumberland Presbyterian Church's virtual Sunday School option. I'm Patricia Pace, and this is the Not So Sunday Sunday School. You do not have to be in church. It doesn't have to be a Sunday when you watch it, and it definitely won't be recorded on a Sunday or in church. Uh, I'm on my front porch on a Saturday morning, and you will probably hear all kinds of sounds of cars and birds and animals. Uh, while we're doing this lesson. We are on the third lesson in the series, Sharing Christ with Others. We've talked about first the Great Commission, about how one of the most important things we have to do as Christians is to share the gospel with others, Jesus's love and his message. Last week, we talked about how do you do that? Well, first you start with prayer. And then this week, we're going to talk about what is the message? Because it's important to know exactly what you want to clearly communicate. And it's very simple. The mes gospel message is very simple, uh, it, but quite transformative, as we know. And this is something we all probably do know, but it is great to have a little refresher to think about uh, what is it? What's the meat that we need to share with those that do not know Christ? What is it that Christ wants us to communicate to others. And so that's where we will be today. So I have a PowerPoint to share, but before we do, let's start in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we ask that you uh, give us knowledge and insight today to these scriptures to help us know how to clearly communicate the message you want people to know about you. And we are so thankful that this is a message we can trust and that we can rely on that is unwavering. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so I want to share. All right, so we receive our lessons or we get our lessons from the curriculum from Lifeway, Bible Studies for Life, adult version. And this is the Sunday School lesson for 5921. And happy Mother's Day, by the way, to all the mothers out there. And there's my name and email. If you would like a copy of the personal study guide or direct YouTube link, you can shoot me an email. Okay, today's scripture comes from Romans chapter 10, 8b to verse 13. And the point is, Jesus saves those who trust him. So trust. Wow. That's something that I don't know that we can do a lot in this world. There are a lot of things that are not trustworthy in this world. And I think you would agree. So our icebreaker question is, where do you turn for trustworthy information? So thinking about, well, where do you get information? We get information from the news, the media. And looking at this, uh, this is a report uh, from Axios, it's an online blog. And it says, media trust hits new low. Would you agree with that? considering what we've been through the past year or two. So th I found this some interesting information and uh, also found it interesting to have a trust barometer. I'm not sure exactly how that works, but so this is a report in January of this year. For the first time ever, fewer than half of all Americans have trust in traditional media, according to this trust barometer. Trust in social media has hit an all-time low of 27%. 56% of Americans agree with the statement that journalists and reporters are trying to mislead people. 58% think that most news organizations are more concerned with supporting an ideology or a political position other than informing the public. And then uh, after the election, the figures deteriorated even further. 57% of Democrats trusted the media, but only 18% of Republicans. So I'll just kind of let that marinate a little bit with you and we won't go too far into it. But um, I do think there's a lot of false information out there, a lot of things that can't be trusted. People have hidden agendas, but um, we can trust the message that's in the Bible, the message that Jesus wants us to communicate. So before we get into this Romans particular chapter, so we have Paul. Paul has not been to Rome yet when he writes these letters. So he has planned and he's spoken of going to Rome. Um, but at the end of his third missionary journey, Paul was led back to Jerusalem. So um, several years later, and scholars think probably around AD 60, 
Paul was provided transportation to Rome and able to act, able to stay on his own house for about two years. And you can find that in Acts, preaching the gospel with all boldness and without hindrance. So his major purpose in this letter to the Romans was to prepare the Christians there for his visit. So to do this, Paul describes the gospel as the righteousness of God. And he also explains that it's the duty and the privilege of those who believe in the gospel to share God's message. So the gospel probably had already been to Rome as a result of Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost 30 years ago, AD, AD 30. Um, if you look in Acts 2, 10, you can see that. So the Christian church had been in Rome for about 30 years before Paul arrived. And it appeared to be made of both Jews and Gentiles. So in this particular passage here that we're going to study, it comes in the middle of a section in which Paul is discussing the relationship of the gospel to Israel. So read this section here, chapter 10, 8b to 10, and then we'll talk about it. Okay, so looking at 8b, or 8, the word is near you, it is in your mouth and in your heart. Uh, that is the message concerning faith that we, we proclaim. So God is telling us that his way to salvation is near, okay? Salvation isn't something, a journey way far away, it is near. And so we want to communicate that to those that we share with, that it's just right here, you don't have to go anywhere for it. And it's near for every individual who is willing to listen truly. And so people can testify to it through the words of their mouth. And then they can rest in the peace that it fills their hearts when they embrace the gospel. So there's like two main points here of what we do with our mouths and hearts. It's sort of two actions in verse nine. So digging in deeper to this message of faith and the role of righteousness. Um, you have to believe in your heart and declare with your mouth. So faith is believing and trusting something or someone. Trust is our reliance on the character, the ability, the strength, or the truth or the person or place or with which we place our trust. So salvation is not dependent on anything we do. Thank goodness. But it's secured by faith in what Jesus has done. So through faith in Jesus, we believe and receive him as our savior. And because he was the perfect atoning sacrifice, there is death and resurrection. And then we declare with our mouth, we confirm our belief in the gospel and the lordship of Christ by confessing it with our mouth. Does that mean you have to do it publicly? No, but... Um, just the acknowledgement is what this means here, that Jesus paid the price for our salvation and our lives are no longer our own. And since he paid the price, he is Lord and master, having all power and authority over us. Okay, looking at verse 10. So after he explains what needs to be done, believe in your heart, declare with your mouth, confess with your mouth. Paul returns to the importance of the heart and the mouth, but he flips the order of confession and belief, but the message remains the same. So first is to um, declare with your mouth and believe in your heart. In verse 10, it's with your heart you believe in your mouth that you profess. So he sort of flips that, that order, but the message is the same. The one who believes with the heart will be justified. So justified is a one-time process that happens at the moment of salvation, the moment where the individual is placed in the permanent right standing before God through the exchanging of human sinfulness for the perfect righteousness of God. So justification is solely based on the saving work of Christ. Nothing we can do, okay? We are justified not because of our good deeds, but because of what Christ did. And I think that's important, important to convey. Um, 
and the one who professes with the mouth, this is a foundational belief to be saved. So let's look here. Lasting truths in this section. Um, and I'll kind of go back. I didn't, I sort of brushed over this, but confessing that Jesus is Lord. Okay. Jesus is Lord. Uh, also is the same idea, acknowledging that he is God. Okay. That, that's important, I think, for the Jewish people in the congregation. Uh, so the early, um, the early Christian confession, Jesus is Lord, expresses the union of God the Father, God the Son. The resurrection of Jesus is essential to the gospel, and our confession of Jesus as Lord and our belief in his resurrection results in our righteousness and our salvation. Nothing we do. We believe and we confess. We acknowledge in our, uh, in, with our mouths, and we believe in our hearts. And again, it doesn't have to be public, although once you have Jesus in your heart, you do want it to be public. Okay, so now we know that the gospel message is centered on the resurrection and the lordship of Christ. So here we're going to learn that the message offers salvation to everyone. Read these to, your, to yourself here. So in verse 11, this scripture offers the assurance that anyone who places their faith in Jesus for salvation will not be put, will never be put to shame. Um, so that's important. Anyone who believes, not just Jews, not just um, a certain ethnic, ethnicity group or religious group. That is the beauty of the gospel. Okay. It's not an elite social club. You don't have to have um, a certain status to be able to get in. The invitation extended is extended to everyone, okay? And if it had to be a club where we were worthy, it would be an empty club because none of us are worthy. Um, so that's, that's kind of his point when uh, Paul opened up earlier in the book of Romans, that we're not worthy. So looking at verse 12, Paul is driving home the theme that uh, there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles in regards to the gospel of this, the gospel of salvation. So, um, you know, that's, that was probably something going on there. Jews felt like they were set apart as his chosen people. And, you know, for a long time, the Israelites saw themselves in a different light than all the nations. And, you know, like humans believed that probably God felt the same way, but, um, so there's probably a little bit of difference there where Jews felt like they were still the bit of a favored child. But here, Paul is making it clear that God sees things from a different lens. He created every person by his own power in his own image. So he is Lord of them all. So no one is exempt from the need of a savior, but at the same time, no one is beyond reach of his love. God doesn't have a plan for Jews and other, another one for Gentiles. The plan is the same, okay? Faith in Christ is the only path to him for every person and people group. That's amazing. So I think that when we do communicate this, it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, your background, the plan is the same. The offer is the same. Salvation is the same. There is no distinction in what your past is or your background and God pours out his grace abundantly for those who receive him through Christ regardless of backgrounds and so Paul writes that God richly blesses those who do accept his offer of salvation for him and um, these blessings you know we can think that they include benefits on earth but probably not the way we think He's not really referring here to monetary or material wealth, although, you know, some Christians do have those things. Um, but it's more of a life to come. Um, so Paul talks in Philippians, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus, Philippians 4.9. So we will be richly blessed with eternal life and that relationship, the peace that comes with knowing Jesus as our Savior. 
So looking at verse 13, he says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So Paul expands God's message of hope by emphasizing everybody is welcome at the foot of the cross. So with those words here, Paul's providing a clear and authoritative statement of humanity's universal need for salvation and God's universal offer to all who will repent and place their faith in Jesus Christ. So, um, lasting truths in Romans 10, 11 through 13. Old Testament and New Testament indicate the universal message of God's, God's gospel invitation. God freely gives salvation to all those who ask him, regardless of any human distinctiveness. God's promise of salvation for those who call on him have no limitations. So as Christians, it definitely is our duty to make sure we communicate this message. We want everyone to be able to hear and have that opportunity because it isn't for an elite club. It is for all. Um, now we'll all accept. No, we know that. But as our duty and as our commission, the Great Commission, were to do that. So what can we do? What are daily actions that could be done? Um, because everybody is created in a different way with different personalities and different skills that how we communicate the gospel message is different based on our own, our own shape, how we're created by God. But it is our duty to find ways to communicate that. So thinking about what can we do this week? What are actions that we can take so we can find ways to have this message, the universal message that uh, salvation is for all and it's near. Um, you don't have to do anything. It's not based on our works, but on Jesus's uh, dying on the cross and his resurrection. So we can reflect. So think back on those who contributed to your salvation and consider what they did that led you to accept the good news they shared. And then <coughs> list ways you can do something similar for others. So thinking back, of course, I was raised in the church. My family played a great role, making sure I was there for Sunday school and uh, church and Sunday night, Wednesday night, and it was discussed as a family. So I was surrounded in an environment where the message was communicated. Um, so I was very lucky in that. Um, and then I think about as I've grown older, just different people who've influenced me, not necessarily about salvation, because I was already saved, but my walk of faith. Um, so think about ways that you can contribute to others. And obviously, like last week, we say pray about it. So you could this week write a note to the individuals who played a role in your coming to faith in Christ. Thank them for their love and obedience in sharing the gospel with you. And again, you may have been saved by someone who's no longer living, or you may have been led to salvation, I should say, to someone who's no longer living. Or maybe it was at um, a revival or a Billy Graham uh, event, something where you, you don't know that person uh, individually or have access to them. Uh, what about other things that people have influenced your faith? Not just salvation, but the growth in, in your walk with the Lord. Maybe shoot them a text or an email or write them a note. Um, and then lastly, let's, we need to share. Prayerfully consider those whom God has placed in your path. Because God, God obviously knows what he's doing. But I think that there are people that are put in our path that we have the duty to share the message with. So look for opportunities to tell them about the message of Christ. I've got two people that I work with. Um, that I definitely think that they're in my path for a purpose. And so, uh, you know, sometimes I, I, I look for ways that I can share. And sometimes it's not using the words necessarily um, specifically from the Bible. You have to kind of look at where that person is coming from, but leading them through relationship and discussions and your own actions, which will make them more open when you do get to the meat of the message. So let God empower you to be an instrument to bring others a saving knowledge of him. So 
And all this looks different based on our personalities, based on what God wants us to do. It could be uh, that we are, uh, I see people sometimes on the side of the road uh, in Wartburg um, preaching with posters and uh, microphones every now and then. So it can be as bold as that, or it can be as subtle as relationships and conversations and uh, but God will lead you just be in prayer about it, about how you can be open to that. And then when he then is taking that step when you know he wants you to. Okay. Okay, so the meat of the message. It's a universal message. Salvation is near for those who listen and take it in their heart. It's for everyone, and you have to just believe. It's nothing you can do, and then profess with your mouth as an acknowledge. It doesn't have to be a public acknowledgement. It can be a private one. And so as Christians, this is a message we need to share, and we can do that in all sorts of ways. And we need to look for opportunities that we have to share, to be intentional, uh, and not let the day pass by without uh, finding ways that God wants to use you. Um, so we'll end in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we ask for help in becoming more aware of the opportunities that are around us to share the gospel. Thank you for your own desire to love us and that you want us to spend eternity with you and that this is a universal, this is for everyone. In your name we pray, amen. Again, happy Mother's Day to the mothers out there. Um, I will see you next week and God bless.